Ladies and gentlemen, uh, as an airshireman that knew bides in Fife, I bring fraternal greetings for you yon the tea. In the words of Yenny Yarain, David Rory, for Ochre is a doctor, Dunedoner and Ochter Dare in Parish, for the men on my mother's side of the family, the Donaldsons and Carotherses, Rocht as miners. Aberdeen and Twal Mile Rune, Fife and all the lands about it, Tain through Scotland's wrinkled map, little's left. And what will do it? Few at least at meters only. Ori folk, it's easy seen. Folk at dinny come fi bonny fife or canny Aberdeen. For by being a good doctor and a bra marker, Rory wrote about the folklore of the miners at the turn of the 20th century. And the proverbs and sayings that he recorded are fantastic. It was said to a man with big feet, for example, he's got a good hod a fife. Or, while well, Buddy was half a clever and nobody can diddle, she's as fly as the fife kai, and they can knit stockings with their horns. <laughs> but to our tale, I'd like to begin with a quote for Hugh McDermott, the child that did more than onibdy to kickstart the Scottish literary renaissance of the 20th century. To be yourselves, and to mark that worth being, no harder job to mortals has been gain. Who can ye fully be yourself? Gain the lead that rocked ye, your very first windy into the world, was gain gay little status in the major cultural institutions that ye gave to as a child. Education, the media, etc, etc. To use another broad line from McDermott, when I was growing up in both education and the media, Scots was very much the bonny brookit bairn of Scottish culture, the beautiful neglected child of Scottish culture. Yet, in wee tunes like Gosted in Ayrshire, we had the good fortune to be the last of the pre-television generations that took the Scots lead in with our mother's milk. My culture was Gosted in Bowhill in West Fife, where my grandmother stayed. I mind expressions that she had. For example, my father wasn't very strong looking. He had guy thin arms, and his good mother constantly said to him, Alec, your arms are that thin, they remind me of twa ply reek. In the Irvine Valley, as a wane, often was seen through the prism of this language. You're into Gosson, there's the Langlock to Kilmarnock, there's Loudon's Woods and Braes, where we get bird nesting, and the birds were called linties and spugs and uh, whops out in the mares and uh, stuckies. And the names of the birds that I would have difficulty this, to this day in thinking of the English name for them. But that's the way it was. Scotch saws was regularly used. The miners had one that was particularly relevant to them. How can a war underneath the grun? It was, you need a stout heart for a sty bray. There was a lot of surreal and earthy humour as well, some no repeatable to a family audience. But a good example is the story of the devil men in a flight in among one another about who yin had the best flowers or the best vegetables to be shown at the local agricultural show. And the one, the killer line that the devil boy had to shut up Andra, he said, Andra, your currets are totally wee things compared to mine. When I poo my out, you can hear the kai routing in Australia. <laughs> Gee in that background, it come as a guy seer gunk and a stun to the sensibilities when I get to the skill and realise that to use the language that Obdi spoke all the time, appeared for to the, the skill master or the or the, the minister or the doctor. That was the equivalent of sticking your tongue out of the teacher. In Scots the Mother Tongue, in my book, I talk about the irony of getting a prize ye day a year for speaking Rabbi's language and then getting the belt the other 364 days for speaking his language in the, in the skill. But that was the way it was. The good thing about that was you learnt guy early on to learn to switch from one to the other. You learnt that you had to be bilingual to survive or you'd get a lick with the toes. So that when I started learning German and French, 
and we could recognize phrases in the most first German reader, die Tochter milchtete die Kuh. The Tochter milked the Kuh, get Scots and get, get German. Similarly, later on, when I read Goethe and heard that in his deathbed, Goethe had asked for mehr Licht, get Scots and get German. With French, my five granny would say, de ne fasse yourself, ne te fasse pas, mon petit brave. Jigget was gigo, assiet was ashet, tassi was a tass, etc., etc. I started at hitchhiking to France and Germany when I pal when I was 16. And being skilly and good at French and German, these were in the days you can get a full grant to go to university. So I went to university to study French and German. But when I was at university, I remind seeing an interview with a famous actor, Peter Ustinov, on the television. And there was a, I could speak French and German reasonably fluently, but I didn't care much about main culture. And Ustinov was interviewed, and the interviewer said how impressive it was that Ustinov can't six or seven languages. And Ustinov replied, that's all very well, but I usually find that people who speak six or seven languages don't have anything of interest to say in any of them. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that got through to me because there was a prude what I could do, but no education in my own culture, apart from the oral tradition, which fortunately was strong as I went growing up in Burns's Ayrshire. So in my second year, I started studying Scottish literature. And what I learnt had the force of revelation and produced in my life an unker revolution that, to paraphrase Burns in the story of Wallace, would pour a Scottish prejudice in my veins that would bile along there till the flood yet a life steak in eternal rest. For what I discovered was that the lead that was hanged by working class wains like me had a pedigree going back hundreds of years in a literature that had international status. I still mind the student of recognition when I discovered their words anent the Bruce in one of the greatest works of Scottish literature. The king lay in Tegolestun, that is recht even anent Loudoun. I used to pass the Boar Castle on my way to Gosson Primary School, Elkidi, and my father had told me about Bruce being there before the Battle of Loudoun Hall. But to see this scrive it in Barber's Bruce gave me a thrill and expanded my sense of what I stayed, who I was, and the folk that I came from. The next, I want to expand on this theme with other Ken Speckle examples of the great Scots tradition, or makers and muckle sangs that you can breathe in the air here in one of the heartlands of Scot, Scots and of Scotland, the North East. And in the beginning, it was Andrew Winton's chronicle that perfectly summed up the nation's predicament after the incident that sparked off the wars of independence. When Alexander, our king, was dead, that Scotland led in law and lee, a war was sown so ill and breed, o wine and wax, o gaming and glee. Our goud was changed into lead, Christ, born in virginity, succor Scotland and remed, that is stayed in perplexity. Our nation was founded on second literature, where the stories in the oral and folk tradition was taken up by Bruce and Barber with Bruce and Blin Harry with Wallace, and our set into high art. Makers that broke their subject matter alive. This is Bruce afore Bannockburn, saying the reasons why they would prevail on that day. The first is that we hae the recht, and for the recht ilk man should ficht. The tither is they are coming here for lippin' in, in their great poo year to seek us in our ain land, and has broke here a right to your hand, richness into say great plenty, that the parish that you shall be, both rich and mighty therewithal, gift that we win as we we'll may fall. The third is that we for our lives and for our children and our wives, and for the freedom of our land are straining it in battle for to stand, and they for their mecht innerly. We are here to defend everything that we love 
they are here to exercise their might. As you can hear, when John Barber screamed at the Bruce here in Aberdeen, our 500 year sign, he wasn't screaming in a local dialect. He was screaming in the Scots that fellow maker Gavin Douglas described as language of Scottish nation. And that lead would become one of the greatest literary leads in Europe, at least between 1400 and 1550. And Barber and Bishop Elphinstone faced time at the University of Paris, where he spoke in Scots, French and Latin. And can you want a visual representation of who they would have regarded their native lead, look up to the ceiling in St Machers and you'll see the heraldic arms of Scotland and Europe depicted together. Barber's Bruce was one of the first declarations of national sovereignty in Europe. Barber and Elphinstone were intensely national and totally international in their belt and showing, their way of looking at the world. Blint Harry's poem about Wallace had the magnificent full title O, The Acts and Deeds of the Illustre and Valiant Campion, Sir William Wallace. This is Blint Harry on the attack on the English occupying forces at Barnwheel near Ayr. An army our indulging in the good claret wine for their other colony of Gascony. Nay watch was set because they had nay doot all Scottish men were without, laboureth in mind, had they been all that day, o ale and wine and yuch chosen he they, as beastly folk tack of themselves nae keep, in their banes soon slid the slothful sleep, through full gluttony and swarf slap it like swine, their chieftain then was great chieftain, Bacchus o wine. Another memory is a wain came when my uncle, we didn't have a car, but my uncle Albert Wiles drove us down to air to the beach. And ilk a time that we passed the turn off the barn wheel on the way to air, my father, I quoted the words that Wallace is supposed to have said when he saw the muckle low coming for the great conflagration in the English camp. Burn ye wheel, ye barns o' air. My father, like Burns, may slightly go that for Hamilton or Gilbert Fields, 18th century version, rather than Blen Harry's 16th century original. But it was the periods of peace that guard the markers in their poetry shine brightness. Robert Henderson, Dunfermline's skillmaster, our setting the fables of Aesop into a Scots that could describe a sleekit toad snoovin' out a dark thicket to perfection in the tale of the fox that beguile the wolf in the shadow of the moon. Laurence come Laurend, for he love it never licht. You can just see the fox coming out the thicket as he said it. Laurence come Laurend, for he love it never licht. Gavin Douglas takes the Aeneid for his blintering hot classical landscape and transports us into a guy snell northern ambience, maybe somewhere about Don Dunkeld, where he rocked as a as a Kirkman and to gie us a gleg gliss of the crudit thrang o' deed sowls, ident to catch the e o' charin, to bring them o'er the river Styx and Acheron. Their rivers and their waters keep it war by yin charin, a grisly ferriar, terrible o' shape and sluggard of a ray, upon his chin fuel canos hair is grey, liop feltret tats, we burning in reed like twa fire breezes, fix it in his heat. Douglas was one of the first to refer to his lead as language of Scottish nation. And like, for example, Dante in Italy or Chaucer in England, you lose that to mark the vernacular, as rich as the classical leads, they would hate to borrow words for other sources. William Dunbar was arguably the misconsummate marker of them all. He a queen Ken Speckle Eertis in a Gowden age for Scots, as a European nation with kings like James IV and James V at the heart of the Renaissance, and big in palaces that, in the words of Sir David Lindsay, included Linlithgow. Lithgay was palace or plaisance, mick be a pattern in Portingal or France. This is Dunbar's tongue in cheek dirge to James IV, trying to persuade him 
to leave the provincial gloom with his hunting palace of Stirling to come back to pre the sensual delicts that he can have in his main palace or Holyrood house in Edinburgh. The reason I think behind this poem was that the other artists at the court tried to persuade Dunbar to persuade him to come back so they would all get paid. When the, when the king was back in Holyrood, the rest of the artists would get paid. So this is the way he tries to persuade him. We that are here in heaven's glory, to you that are in purgatory, commends us in our hurtly wise. I mean we folk in paradise, in Edinburgh, we all merriness to you of Stirling in distress. For neither pleasance nor delight is for pity this epistle writes. Och ye herbits and hanker sidles, that dax your penance at your tables, and eats nocht wine confortative, and eats nocht meat restorative, ye may in heaven here with us dwell, to eat swan, cran, pertric and pluver, and every fish that swims in river, to drink with us the new fresh wine that grew upon the river or Rhine, fresh fragrant claret suit of France, of Angers and Orleans, with money a course so great dainty, say ye, Amen, for charity. Can I could wail ye precious minute for Scottish history to travel back in time to it would be to New Year's Day 1537 in Notre Dame Cathedral at the Wadden Our King James V and the French Princess Madeleine de Valois. Fortunately, it was captured by one of France's finest makers, Pierre de Ronsard, who described it thus, the King of Scots. Son port histoire royale, son regard vigoureux, de vertu et d'honneur et de guerre amoureux, la douceur et la force illustrent son visage, comme si Venus et Mars en avoir fait partage. His bearing was regal, his luck through a smedum, virtue, honour and amorous engagement. Douceness and brecht ver lifted up his face as again Venus and Mars had conjoined at its marking. The Ronsar came with Madeline T. Embra. The court of James VI, T. was strung with Scots poetry. Jamie even screeved a square, cried rules and cottles, rules and cautions. The full title being a short treatise containing some rules and cottles to be observed and dissuaded in Scottish poesy, and printed in Edinburgh in 1584 as part of a collection of essays on the divine art of poesy. Yet, when he became James I of England and gave to London, there would be no court support for Macker's only mayor in Scotland. So the high register of Scots poetry began to work its way down through the society, and in a way a cultural vacuum was created. The folk song tradition, however, did go on, and this verse for the most troopers lament on the end of the tradition of border families reaving cattle over in England, threeps the new order, guy wheel. The king is over the border again, in London for to dwell, and friends we mun where England be, since he bides there himself. And we'll gang the mirror roving, a roving through the nicht, we'll gang the mirror roving, like the moonshine air se bricht. Starting with the mackers and Scots aristocrats at court, he had the slow, slow percolation of the English language doing through the society. But at least ye marker took tent of what was being tinted in the process. And here I'm on beg, ladies and gentlemen, eh, leaving ye to lapse briefly into English. For that's the lead that Zachary Bide yeast to describe the new linguistic duality and reality that the markers were confronted with. Words fine before are banished from the court and get no room but with a country sort. Men's mouths like trees bear words as leaves that fall, now green and good, anon, are withered all. The words which why loom all men did admire, loathes in a trice, may henceforth not appear. No more than changing French with gallant shoes could be content to wear the Irish trues. Our words, like clothes, 
Such is vain man's condition, in length of time does all wear out of fashion. We are like echo, which by voice begot, from hollow veils speaks words it knoweth not. The duality with Hickton, after the political union with England, how could it know, in a country with capital city's bells, rung out with all their, why am I so sad on my wadden day, the day the Act of Union was passed in 1707. It's no coincidence that Finuon, the great works of man's duality and doppelgangers, for the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, to the private memoirs and confessions of a justified sinner, through to the divided self, were all produced by Brother Scots. Another Aberdonian, Geordie Gordon, Lord Byron, was yet the first to suggest it was a hurt versus heed division, for I am half a Scot by birth and bred a whole one, and my heart flies to my head. The new and ilk a poet had to decide who to be him or herself, and to mark that word being. And fortunately, with a wheen brilliant markers in the 18th century, what could scrive brawly wheel in English, but wheel at Scots to achieve their best work. Now you needed a stout heart for a stay bray, because Obdi was affected by the endemic Anglicisation sweeping the country. It even affected the reaction to Burns's brilliant Scots verse. In a famous review of the Kilmornock edition, in The Lounger, Henry Mackenzie wrote, One bar indeed his birth and education have opposed to his fame, the language in which most of his poems are written. Mackenzie, like many critics since, have got it totally wrong. Had Burns scrive it only in Augustan English, he would have just been another obscure Augustan versifier, like other Edinburgh writers like Dr. Blacklock. But instead, he held on to who he was and wrote masterpieces of world literature, the Tamashanter to Old Lang Syne. When I come across the pronouncements of the Henry Mackenzies of this world, and ladies and gentlemen, there's still a lot of them about, I hey I mind of McDermott's pit dune or sick like Scots. Mercy, O oh God, I can a thole with sick an ori mob to roll. Wished it's for the good of your soul. It uh, will be good for my soul. I'm just no share what is dain to my sore heat. Uh, Burns's father, of course, came for the mairns. So he'd been at home, understanding the male or dialects, as did other makers of the 18th century. Robert Ferguson was buried in the Canongate Kirkyard, and a binham, a heat stain, booked by Rabbi Burns, who cried him, by far my older brother in the muse. Ferguson's folk were Northeast Episcopalians for D side. He was educated at the high school of Dundee and St Andrews University. And this is one of my favourite poems by Ferguson. I did a, a CD and a, an LP originally back in the 80s called Ferguson's Old Ricky, where I celebrated the poetry of Robert Ferguson and the music oh, 18th century Edinburgh with Jock Thompson's Burns. And this is for a poem of his called Colour Oysters. <clears throat> oh, all the waters that can hobble a fishing yawl or salmon cobble, and can reward the fisher's trouble or south or north, there's nane so spacious and so noble as firth of forth. In her, the skate and codlin sail, the eel foo souple wags her tail, with heron, fluke, and mackerel, and whitens dainty, their spinnel shanks, the lobsters trail, with partons plenty. All Drake's sons, blithe faces wear, September's merry month is near, that brings in Neptune's colour cheer, new oysters fresh, the hailsomest and nicest gear o' fish or flesh. O oh, then, we need na gi a plaque for donnerin mounty bank or quack. Wha are their drugs say boldly crack and spread sick notions as gar their feckless patient tack their stinking potions? Come, pre, frail man, for gin do art sick, the oyster is a rare cathartic that every doctor patient gar click to cure his ails, whether ye have the heed or heart ache, it aye prevails. Ye tipplers, 
open all your posies. Ye who are fast way, plucky noses, fling o'er your crags sufficient doses. Your thole hunner, the flag of war, the summer roses, and nothing under. Another Edinburgh screever, Robert Louis Stevenson, spark of the fizzing vitality of Ferguson's verse, bringing the street life of the cannon gate alive with sick dumfuner and smedum that even clarty urban subjects like violence by the polis, the mainly healing city geared, was cloaked in graphic detail in Hallow Fair. This is whiles what the local boys had to throw. Jock Bell get forth to play his freaks, great cause he had to rue it, for frae a stark lochaber axe he got a clammy hewet fu sair that nicht. Och own quo he, I'd rather be by sword or bayonet stick it than he my croon or body with sick deadly weapons nick it. With that he got another streak, mere wechty than afore. That guard his feckless body ache and spew the reeking gore fu rid that nicht. He pecking on the cause we lay, o' kicks and cuffs, wheel seared. A highland oath, the sergeant gay, she mon be see your geared. Oud spark the warlike corporal, bring in ta Duncan sot. They trailed him ben, and by my soul he paid his drunken groat for that neist day. Get folk, as ye come for the fair, bide yont through this black squad. There's nae six savages elsewhere allowed to wear cockade. Then the strong lion's hungry maw, or tusk or Russian bear, through their one ruly felon paw, mere cause ye had to fear your death that day. Despite this ver, another modern strand of thought was established back then. It's what I cry the Scots death wish. That Scots is braw and fine in its place, but inevitably it's dean. And what's for it, on no get by it. This is for the marker to posterity by Robert Louis Stevenson. Few spark it then, but knew there's nane. My poor old sangs lie o' their lane. Their sense that yin was braw and plain tint o' the gither, like runes upon a standing stain among the heather. Ironically, Stephen himself created masterpieces and cutty tales like Thrawn Janet in great scots, and my youngest daughter, Katrina, still gets a flag and a chitter in her veins whenever she hears the word Thrawn Janet that I used to read to her as a bairn. Robert Louis Stevenson brings me on to the other strand and end scots that I want to cover a wee bit tonight. And yen this, I guard my een licht up and my hair diddle with pride only time I find manifestations of it in fourth long airts of the world that I travelled for pleasure for my programmes on the diaspora for the BBC or for the book The Scottish World. For example, Robert Louis Stevenson being invited to the Royal Palace in Waikiki by the half Hawaiian, half Scottish princess Kayulani to eat some good scotch cow cow. And that's how she wrote it, invited Stevenson for some good scotch cow cow. Cow cow is the Hawaiian word for, Creole word for food. Or in the Royal Cemetery in Honolulu, where Kaiolani is buried in a tomb, I came across the grave stain of Captain Alexander Adams for Arbroath. He run the Navy for the Hawaiian King <coughs> and is buried there alongside one of his drinking cronies, who is also for Scotland. And the gravestone reads, Two cronies through the land of heather lie sleeping here in death together. Or Stevenson coming across one of the first wine pioneers in Napa Valley. He cried at the Lang Green Strath with Napa Valley and saying this about him. Mr. McEachran's is a bachelor establishment, a little bit of a wooden house, a small cellar hard by in the hillside and a patch of vines planted and tended single-handedly by himself. He'd but recently begun. His vines were young, his business young also, but I thought he had the look of a man who succeeds. He hailed from Greenock. He remembered his father putting him inside Mon's <coughs> Meg, and that touched me home. And we exchanged a word or two of Scots, which pleased me more than you would fancy. Or, on the other side of the American continent, at the turn of the 20th century, 
Charles McNeill often cried the poet laureate of North Carolina in his attempts to recreate the voices of the folk run about him. African American, Native American also scrived a number of poems in Scots. Here's Yen on the Cape Fear, where he tells the story of his mixed Hieland and Lowland community for Argyll and the fact that they could never quite get it right to choose the winning side in only the various battles and wars <coughs> that his people got uh, caught up in, whether it was Culloden, whether it was the American War of Independence or it was the, the war of uh, the war, the Civil War in America. Prince Charlie and I, we were chased over the sea with nothing but conscience for glory. And here I drew sword when the land would be free and was whipped to a hole as a Tory. When the bonny blue flag was flung to the breeze, I girded myself to defend it. They warsalt me doon to my hons and my knees and flogged my old back bane to bend it. So the deal won the fight and rang hods the grund, but good in my cell when I bide it. I strength in my arm yet for money around and purpose in plenty to guide it. I've been banished and whopped and warsalt and flogged. I belong to the Democrat party, but in gain our quagmires, I hinna been bogged and I'm still on my legs, hail and hearty. A poem in Scots for North Carolina, 1910. Or, in South Africa, Charles Murray, a Dorit the poet of them among you at a certain age, will ken through his poem The Whistle, there was in every skill anthology that Wayne's goat cried the poet's queer lang sign. Well, here's what he screeved anent Scotland oor mither. Scotland oor mither, this fear sons abroad, leaving tracks on virgin belt that never kent a road, trekking on wi weary feet and faces turned for hame, but loving I, the old wife, across the seas the same. Scotland, oor mother, since first we left your side, fi killy man to Cape Toon, we've wandered far and wide, yet I fi mine and camp and toon, fi copy and caru, your sons, rich kindly, old wife, send hame their love to you. One of my favourite songs of exile. I go it for a friend of mine <coughs> who's a tremendous border tradition bearer, man for Selkirk, Watt Elliot. His great grandfather, also Watt Elliot, was a friend of the author Sandy Glendinnan. Glendinnan was a herd in Esdale Mayor. We used to meet Walter Elliot, herd in Ettrick, at the steps of Glengerrick, on the watershed between the valleys. In 1824, Sandy decided to emigrate to Ontario, but he never tint his love of the border hulls, and the poem A Wall with Canada's Muddy Creeks clearly shows this. A wall with Canada's muddy creeks and Canada's fields of pine. Your land of wheat is a goodly land, but all oh, it is na mine. The heathy hill, the grassy dale, the daisy spangled lee, the purlin burn and craggy lin, old Scotia's glens gee me. Oh, I would like to hear again the lark on Tinnis Hill and see the wee bit gowany that blooms aside the rill. Like banished Swiss who views afar his Alps with langin' e, I gazed upon the morning star that shines on my country. Nay mere I'll win the Esdale pen or Pentland's craggy cone. The days can ne'er come back again with thirty year that's gone. But fancy off that midnight tour while still across the sea, ye stream amid a pleasing dream, I saw the old country. Each wheel kent scene that met my view broke childhood's joys to mind. The blackbird sang in fushy lin the song he sang lang syne, but like a dream time flees awa, again the morning came, and I awoke in Canada, three thousand mile for him. There's a great recording of that by the Canadian folk singer Stan Rogers. And when I hear it, I mind of Mary Slessor and the comment by a wee African bairn in Calabar in Nigeria on Mary and her Scots friends when they were homesick and sung sentimental songs like Sweet Rothsey Bay, Bonnie Strathire or Loch Lomond. They too were about 3,000 miles for home. 
And the emotion of the singing obviously go to this wee African boy because he said, I don't like these songs. They make my heart big and my eyes water. Mary kept a good Scots tongue in her head all her days in West Africa. She too was born and bred in Aberdeen and flitted to Dundee as a wee lassie. So she likely had a mix of Doric and Dundee in her speech. When she was at the beginning of her house in Akpap or Coyon, and I've stood in the veranda of her house, she went native for about 40 years, Mary, but finally, when she became an old woman, she decided to build a comfortable house, a European-style house, for herself. <clears throat> and at the beginning of the house, she broke to our folk for Scotland to help her. And she became an expert at laying cement flares. The reason for that was to keep the driver ants a wall. A fella Scott, dumbfoonered by her skill at the dark, speared who had taught her the art of cement making. Mary's repone was a classic. Nobody. I just mix it and stir it like porridge. <laughs> then I turn it out, smooth it with a stick and say, Lord, here's the cement. If it be thy will, please set it. And the eye this. <laughs> I'm pretty against Scott's tongue in my head. And Gian talks as far apart as places like Poznan in Poland and Calabar in Nigeria. I've experienced the warmth that a vo Scots voice can generate. In Poznan, it was old Polish soldiers who had been stationed in the east coast of Scotland during the war. And they came to the talk because they missed hearing Scots voices. In Calabar, it was the congregation in Duke Town Parish Kirk. And when they heard my voice, they had missed a couple of decades since the, the Scots had left there, since colonial times. But what they recognised in my voice was the voice of the good teachers that had taught them in the mission skills. And the voice of Mary Slessor herself. And literally, you could feel a, vis a visceral wave of love come towards you just having this voice. It was an amazing experience. The love for Mary was visceral and tangible, and uh, it reminded me of another old Scots saw that my mother and father used and gave me when I was a wee boy and I used in the frontispiece of my book, The Scottish World. Them where I get Scots tongue in their head are fit to gun over the world. Another remarkable sect in the Scots abroad came in 1802 when the Edinburgh Missionary Society persuaded the Russian Tsar to give them 18,000 acres of land in Karas in the North Caucasus in an attempt to plant Presbyterianism among the Muslim tribes of Circassia. They didn't succeed. But a few decades after the mission was given up in the 1870s, a journalist for the London Times, a Scot called Mackenzie Wallace, was travelling in the region and came across the word Sherlanskia Colonia, Scots colony, scrive it on a Russian map. He gave there and wasn't getting very far until he was directed to the village patriarch who was happy in black with a long black beard. Wallace speared at the patriarch in Russian whether he came to only Scotsman living there. The patriarch asked him why he wanted to come because I'm a Scotsman and would like to meet them, said Wallace. Let the reader imagine my astonishment when in reply to this, he answered in genuine broad Scotch, Old man, I'm a Scotsman too. My name's Joan Abercrombie. <laughs> when I had recovered a little from my surprise, I ventured to remark to this enigmatic pers personage before me that though his tongue was certainly Scotch, his face was as certainly Circassian. Will, will, he replied, evidently enjoying my look of mystification. You're no forerang. I'm a Circassian Scotsman. This gentleman was the leader of the community. He'd been taken out of slavery, bought out of slavery from one of the Muslim tribes and had been given a Scots education and became the leader of his people. And it was a remarkable story. Before I come to the concluding part of my lecture, I want to give a mention to Yenner Twa poets for other years that I feel should be included in the Scottish canon because of their thrang connections to Scotland. You know the pleasures <coughs> of making programmes about Scots abroad is that ye character I leads to another. 
So, abena fjord, uside bergen, in Edvard Griegs hus a Trollhagen. I was there today, a program about the Scots in Scandinavia, Edvard Grieg, the Cairn Bulg, was obviously somebody to, to go for. But there, they kept saying to me, well, you're here, you hate to do something about Peter Das. And I said, what? And they said, Peter Dundas, who is uh, the son of Peter Dundas, a merchant for Dundee, who lived in northern, uh, northern Norway, and his son Peter Das became the great Baroque poet of Norway, whose poem, uh, Nurland Trompeta, about the fisher folk for the northeast, for the north of Norway, is declaimed by every schoolway in, in Norway, and who wrote some beautiful hymns that are still sung in the kirk in Norway. Das would have been brought up speaking Scots and Norwegian, so I translated for his Norwegian uh, one of his poems via somebody who, uh, a friend who translated it into English first for me. And it goes, O Jesus, at your altar fit, we boo our knee to bend, and there we seek a soft remed where dwine and souls to mend. Your holy bidden guards us come and tear your wadden board to feed upon your manna. Give us a blessed taste, O Lord, that we can give both laud and gloire and sing a lewd hosanna. A wee mention of a pickle other childs for the northeast that travelled northern Europe for the 16th to the 18th century. Patrick Gordon of Luchris, who became the Richthofen man of Peter the Great in Russia. Wealthy merchants like Dancing Wally Forbes who built Craigievar Castle, my favourite castle in the Hale of Scotland. Or Robert Gordon, who was fortunes founded the forerunner of this very institution, Robert Gordon University. I've seen his hoose or the original Robert Gordon in Haligay Street in Gdansk in Danzig. Their chills would have spoken Scots, Latin, German and Polish. And it had belonged the Scottish Brotherhoods that had branches in the 12 major cities across Poland, Prussia and Lithuania, whose records in the Green Book of Lublin are scrive in a male of Scots, German and Polish. And there's Here's tea. These are those wealthy merchants that settled in Stary Scotsy or Old Scotland district in Gdansk. But they gave peddlers packs to young boys for Aberdeenshire and for the hinterland of Dundee. And they went into the countryside and sailed directly to the peasantry. And say ubiquitous worthy that the word in German and in Polish for a peddler and a Scot is the same. They just use the word shot for a peddler and a Scot. When I was a wee boy and I was bad, my mother says, eh, the bogeyman was coming to get you. Well, in Germany and Poland in the 17th century, it wasn't the bogeyman, it was der Schotte. Warte bis der Schotte kommt. You wait till the Scots come and take you away. A bit like the raggle taggle gypsies. And finally, another Will Skent screever for another four flung air. <clears throat> that appeals to the expansive vision of global Scottishness that I've got and cherish in my heart. Lermontov, Scriven, about the Helens in Russia. Pod zanavesiu tumana, pod nevom bur sredisti pei, stait magila asiana, vgorok shetlandi maye. In the quarries of my Scotland, under a har a cold mist, atween a lift of storms and dry sons, the grave o Ossian exists. Lermontov there, echoing both the vogue for the poetry of Ossian and Scott in Russia, but also acknowledging his Scottish forebear. A soldier of fortune cried, George Lermont, who began his European adventure fechting for Poland, was gruppet by the Russians in 1613, and when he came out of the jail, settled down in Moscow, where his name changed for the Scottish Lermont to the Russian Lermontov. When I did my series on the Scots in Russia, I tracked down a descendant of Lermontov for the mother side of his family, and Mary Korolyeva teaches Gaelic, Scottish Gaelic, in Moscow University, and was involved in the bigging of a monument in the borders that commemorates the other poetic giant that came from the Lermont Lermontov family, Man Kent as Thomas Reimer, True Thomas, Thomas Erseldun, or Thomas Lermont. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I'm very aware that time is passing, so I want to finish by bringing it all back home and coming to some conclusions anent the Scots lead spoken and scrive it the day. I did a programme in about Scots, the state of Scots today, a few years ago, where I interviewed my friend, the poet Matthew Fitt, and he told me about a teacher in Glasgow, in a skill in Glasgow, who introduced her lessons on Burns by scriving in big letters on the blackboard slang. Now you can call that the Scottish cringe, you can call that ignorance, you can call it owning you want, but the word I would use, after all you've heard the night, of somebody describing, a, you know, somebody being produced by the Scottish Education Department, that somebody could describe the leader Burns and McDermott and Dunbar as slang is absolutely tragic. But I'll no leave you with second a tragedy. Instead, I'll give you reasons to look for it and hold gone with your love for our ain rockle mother tongue that's in the mouths and importantly is in the hearts of at least 1.5 million Scots from Maidenkirk to Johnny Groats. All leaving things hate to be cherished. And finally, Scottish society is realising for the good of its culture, its literature, its tourism and its very identity that the Scots lead is embedded in the experience of what marks us Scots. The fact we finally hear a census question on Scots was very important in the recognition, recognition of its status as one of the three indigenous leads that were graced we here in Scotland, Gaelic, English and Scots. And in the lead the day, in Ilka's Scots speaking area, there's a Queen Macker's novelist poets that explore their lead and mark brilliant poetry eh, out of it. And I can think of faces for Galloway in the southwest to Shetland in the north and here in the northeast, great folk like Sheena sitting here. The weekend that the, the lead is in good horns among our makers of the day. I'd like to end with two stories that tell us who unique a country Scotland is. The first was told to me by a poet cried Ellie MacDonald for Dundee, who uses Scots as well. Ellie, this was about the 1970s. Ellie was on a train home to Dundee after a day out in Edinburgh at a poetry festival. Her fellow traveller <clears throat> was a younger English poet who disagreed with Ellie's assertion that ordinary working class Scots had only kind of poetic sensibility, apart from maybe a few words of Burns. To prove his point, the English poet speared at the geared on the train when he checked the tickets Guinea Kent only modern Scottish poetry at all. The Gaird replied, I, and declaimed, Ye wat fornicht in the yow trommel, I saw yon antering thing, a water go with its chittering licht ayond the onding, and I thought to the last well luck ye geed afore ye deed. There was nae reek in the leverock's house that nicht and nane in mine, but I he thought to that foolish licht ever since syne. And I think maybe at last I can what Don Luke meant then. A result for Ellie and the Gaird, who was a communist and who was broke up in the great tradition of left the centre, right and back in the 20s and 30s and 40s. And like the great Gaelic bard Sorley MacLean, who was writer in residence when I was at Edinburgh University, was a great devotee of McDermott's early Scots lyrics. The other story concerns the Burns phenomenon. But as an Ayrshireman, his family was steeped in the leaving tradition of Burns' songs, and like him, I was a lad that was born in Kyle, and Vaunty of Burns' contribution to Scotland and the world. One of my own highlights as a commentator in Scottish culture was to give a lecture in Scots at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. for the Burns 250th Symposium there in 2009. My daughter Joanna was doing her Masters in Law at Georgetown University at that time, so it was a family occasion as well. There I spoke about Burns' universal appeal, but I'd like to end by bringing him home to Scotland as well, where the broad words in his good Scots tongue are still in the mouths and hearts of ordinary folk. And as we can for Burns' words, nay treasures nor pleasures could make us happy lang the hurt 
eyes that peered, I, that Max's Recht or rang. Burns wrote in the language of the herd. My wife, Joan, who's at the back of the, the room just now, came to Scotland for the first time in 1978 for the Scottish University Summer School. In the taxi fare to her holler residence for the, the, the Edinburgh Airport, the driver asked her what she was doing in Edinburgh. And when she said she was there to study English literature, the taxi, the taxi driver replied that while she was here, she should also study and hear some Scottish literature. And then he proceeded to recite Burns. I've beheard the hill way for Edinburgh Airport to the south side of Edinburgh. No taxi driver in Lisbon had ever quoted Louise de Camões or Fernando Pessoa at João of Four. A few days later, a Swiss boy was astonished to discover a rose, a red rose, on his bed, along with the words of Burns's poem, My Love is Like a Red, Red Rose. The lassie that read up his room had taken a fancy to him and left him the rose and the poem. Joao and her fellow foreign students come to the realisation guy quickly that Scotland has a very special culture, where the work of a poet, writing in Scots, was that ingrained in the spirit of the folk that belong here that we can't imagine a Scotland without them. That's the kind of country I want to belong to. That's the kind of Scotland we've been celebrating here the next. Events like this give us faith in our culture and mind us of McDermott's memorable words that end my book, Scots the Mother Tongue, and finish my lecture the next. For we have faith in Scotland's hidden poors, the present's theirs, but all the past and futures ours. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.